God's promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering Jeremiah chapter 30. What a great passage to look at today. Verses 1 through 11, so stay there. In three minutes, we're going to talk about it. It's going to be very, very interesting as we go through the weeping prophets' proclamations of what God said. Corey and Ryan are also here in about 17 minutes. Corey, what's going on? We're taking a look at the last few kings of Judah and Jerusalem. Ryan? Well, today our assigned reading is Jeremiah 29 to 31, but I want to zoom out and do an overview of the entire book. That's going to be very interesting, an overview. Okay, very good. And Janice? Write in a book for yourself. All right, take your Bible guide, turn to it today, the reading today, and we're going to look at what the Bible says. We're going to read from the Bible, and God is speaking to us. Let's listen. Jeremiah 30, 1 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turning pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from your neck, and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Therefore do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be quiet and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice, and will not let you go altogether unpunished. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. Israel. There is no other nation in the world that is named by God Almighty. It is a fascinating nation and it is an amazing time since 1948 to be here and to be a part of what God is doing. You know, we need to pray and ask the Lord to help us today because that's what we do. Father, we pray today for Israel and help us to understand it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. You know, God is not finished with Israel yet. I think that it is safe to say in the light of our reading today and in the light of recent events, it's safe to say that. In the past, the concept was harder to grasp because it seemed like the nation of Israel was gone and it seemed like it would never come back. What was the chance of her ever coming back after nearly 2,000 years? But in 1948, the nation of Israel came to life again. Her modern history has been full of resistance, wars, and battles. Think of 1967. I was six years old. The Yom Kippur War. The surprise attack on Israel in 1973. I was 14. And, of course, the most recent war that begun with a terrorist attack against Israel October of 2023. 
God is not surprised by any of this, even though we often are. It can be hard to understand the details of biblical prophecy until we see it play out. But God has foretold through his prophets that there is a longer and larger plan for Israel that perhaps we don't know about and we didn't think of. Now, this is something that I find impossible to ignore as we read through God's promises in Jeremiah chapter 30, because God has promised certain things to happen. Now, everybody has to ask the question, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Israel was replaced. I thought, you know, hold on a minute. No, God is not finished with Israel yet. That's very, very important. Chapter 30 is fascinating as we read this. Uh, we need to pray that God would help us. We need to pray that God would see us. But before we do that, you can take your, your Bible guide or get your Bible guide. If you don't have one, write to us or call us. And you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Bible guide. It takes you to a page where you can download it exactly how it's printed. But we need to pray now. Father, help us as we study these first 11 verses of chapter 30. Help us to hear what you're saying and help us to know what you're talking about in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Look at the first verse. It's amazing. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. There's no question. This is the word of God. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. God's promise is in the same Yesterday, today, and forever because he is Lord. That's in Hebrews. He is Lord. We would do well to listen and trust in what God tells us in his word. We're going to read some things here. It's going to be very, very interesting. But I think we need to pay attention to this because as we focus on this and as we understand it, we need to learn that God is speaking. Now, that's important. Because as we hear this, we need to hear God. Let's read on. It says in verse four, Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what it says. For thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Now, ask or ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor without a child. So let me ask you a question. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins, like a woman in labor, and all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great, and so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at that, the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from his neck and burst your bonds. Foreigners shall have no more in, to enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. This is interesting. God tells us that Messiah's kingdom will come soon. Jesus Christ will reign as king of Israel for a thousand years. I want to tell you something. This is important to hear, important to know, because this is something that still is going to happen, what I believe. This is talking about it here, back in the 5th century, the, the 6th century BC. That's very important. We need to keep that in mind. Now, listen carefully. We're going to read more about this. Go to verse 10. Watch this. Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar, your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. No one shall make him afraid, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you, 
Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. I will not make a complete end of you. That's God said that. But I will correct you in justice and I will not let you go altogether unpunished. Oh my goodness. God will continue to work and demonstrate his word to the world. When we know the word of God, we know Jesus Christ as Lord. When we know the word of God, we know Jesus Christ as Lord. You know, there's a reason that we focus so heavily on the Bible. Because the Bible, this, this is the word of God. And if anything on television, if anything on the internet, if anything anywhere needs to be propagated and promoted, it's the 66 books of the Bible. So we promote it. Because the more we know the word of God, the more we know about what God is going to do, because this is all set in the context of prophecy. God always says, Jesus is coming back soon. God is coming back soon. So we need to hear that. And we need to pray that God speaks to our hearts today, because this is Jeremiah, fifth century. This is Jeremiah. And we need to ask the Lord to, to help us. So, Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us. As we look at this, as we consider this, help us to see your prophecy. Now, Lord, we're not a prophecy program and all that, but we are a program about your word. And you've set your gospel, your good news about Jesus Christ in the context of prophecy. You said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelations 3.20. Any man who opens that door, I will come in and have dinner with him. Lord, we have to open the door. Help us to open the door in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, as we read through the Old Testament book of the prophet Jeremiah, we see pretty quickly that Jeremiah is alive during the last days of the Jerusalem uh, kingship. You know, uh, it's a really tumultuous political time, and he mentions several different kings of Jerusalem that he prophesies to or that he interacts with. So today, you and I are going to take a look at the last few kings of Judah and Jerusalem, put them in order, and uh, see what we can learn about their time times and reigns. The last four kings of Judah ruled over uncertain times from their capital city of Jerusalem. They bore the famous lineage of David and Solomon, and while their citizens remained loyal to the royal bloodline, the monarchy had undoubtedly lost much of its power. Jehoahaz was the 16th son of Solomon to take the throne of Jerusalem, and his short-lived kingship was all in thanks to the political aspirations of his father, King Josiah. Josiah was a godly king, but he had died in battle trying to influence world politics. The Egyptian army was marching to Carchemish to support the last-ditch effort of Assyria to resist the rising Neo-Babylonian Empire. Since Judah had long been subject to Assyria, Josiah was hoping to see Assyria and Egypt defeated. In reality, he only succeeded in swapping overlords for his sons. Jehoahaz lasted a mere three months on the throne before the Egyptians stopped at Jerusalem, took him captive, and replaced him with his brother Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was now an Egyptian vassal king. He was allowed to rule over a Judah loyal to Egypt and had to send yearly tribute to prove it. Three years into Jehoiakim's reign, he was forced to switch Jerusalem's allegiances again, becoming a Babylonian vassal in the face of the Babylonian military. At this point, the prophet Jeremiah warned against any rebellion, but to no avail. Ever loyal to the pharaoh that had made him king, Jehoiakim eventually rebelled against Babylon. Quickly after this rebellion, he died or was murdered, leaving his 18-year-old son Jehoiachin to deal with the Babylonian response. 
it didn't go well. Jehoiachin, most of the royal family, courts, royal wealth, soldiers, and skilled craftsmen were taken away to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar did all but destroy the city. He left what he thought was a thoroughly humiliated people who knew the consequences of rebellion. He appointed 21-year-old Zedekiah of the royal family to be his new vassal king. For Zedekiah, the writing was on the wall, or more accurately, in the books of Jerusalem's prophets. He rebelled by defaulting on his tribute payments, resulting in a two-year siege and the destruction of Jerusalem's wall, city, palaces, and the Temple of Solomon. There we go. So now I hope as you see Jeremiah's interactions with these different kings that some of this background information can help you uh, understand a little bit more what's going on contextually. Very interesting as we go through the book of Jeremiah. It's been fascinating. Look at the discoveries we found and all the things in this book. Uh, it's a very, a lot of people don't read Jeremiah because he's a weeping prophet, you know, but uh, we learn so much from him because his Definitely. word is so important. God's word is so important with Jeremiah. Okay, right. Yes, well, our reading today is Jeremiah 29 to 31, but as I mentioned earlier, today I want to zoom out and take a big picture look at the entire book. There's a lot that we can learn about Jeremiah. So this segment is sort of an introduction and overview of the entire volume. Check it out. Although the book of Isaiah has more chapters, in actuality, Jeremiah is the second longest book of the Bible, next to the Psalms. It is the only one of the Old Testament books that tells us some details of its origin. According to Jeremiah 36, Baruch, the scribe, had written a first version at the dictation of Jeremiah. The scroll was read first in public, then again for the state officials and for the king. Furious at the contents, King Jehoiakim cut the scroll piece by piece and fed it into the fire. Undaunted by the evil king, Jeremiah dictated a second and enlarged edition of the first book to Baruch. What's interesting is that the structure of the book is not based on chronology or form. The confessions of Jeremiah are scattered through the various chapters. Oracles of hope sometimes interrupt the stories about Jeremiah. Words against kings and prophets often appear to be independent collections. The complex nature of the book structure is further complicated by evidence from the earliest Greek translation. There, the oracles against foreign nations are in a different order. This suggests a long and complicated process of collecting Jeremiah's words. Nevertheless, his prophecies proved accurate, which is the hallmark of a true prophet of the God who declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Significantly, the book of Jeremiah contains some scientific allusions as well. For example, Jeremiah 10.13 and 51.16 proclaim that when God utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, he brings the wind out of his treasuries a beautiful yet scientifically sound conception of the atmospheric phase of the hydrologic cycle. That is the process by which water evaporates, condenses in the clouds, and then returns to the earth as precipitation. Notably, though an adequate scientific description of the hydrologic cycle evaded scholars till only a few hundred years ago, the Bible here and in several other places described it thousands of years earlier. The book also boldly proclaims that God will cast off all the seed of Israel only if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath. A clear and accurate scientific allusion to the utter vastness of the universe and the great depths of the earth. Yet perhaps one of the most important lessons we can learn from the moving book of Jeremiah is that faithfulness to God is costly. Probably no other Old Testament prophet suffered more than Jeremiah did. He was rejected by his own priestly father and stoned by his friends on the streets of Jerusalem. Jeremiah knew imprisonment many times and was later called a traitor by the country he loved. Tradition says people who tired of hearing his prophetic pronouncements finally stoned him to death. You know, the book of Jeremiah really is incredible. And though he faced a lot of opposition and adversity, he remained faithful to God's word. And this should be an encouragement to us because thinking about all the terrible hardships Jeremiah faced can help us to bear any sort of persecutions that we face. And you know, there's an old African proverb that rings true and it says that a speaker of truth has no friends. Well, Jeremiah was a prime example of that. Yet he was such an incredibly faithful man of God. 
So we can really learn a lot from Jeremiah. You know, one of the interesting things about this is that the end of Jeremiah, you never, I mean, at the end of the book, we're half, a little over halfway through the book, but at the end of the book, you know that he goes to uh, Egypt, even though he tells them not to go to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And we, we never know what happens to Jeremiah. We, we just don't know. I mean, did he, did he die in Egypt? Did he come back? Did he, I mean, what happened to Jeremiah? We don't know. Yeah, that's very, right. very interesting. I find that fascinating. All right. I uh, want to give him a hug when I get to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you know what? I just yeah. want to say thank you. Because, I mean, nobody liked him. He had some friends. He did. He had oh, some well, allies. He did. He saved him from a, and and um, Abed Melek, who saved him from. Yep. Well, the yeah, he, he had, but but I he mean, did. I, I mean, but they he, were few and far between. <laughs> they were. He just had a really hard message mm -hmm. because his, and he it, had to watch a lot of hard things. And it's like Ezekiel. Ezekiel didn't have a lot of friends either. But that's a whole other story for another day. We'll get into that. Anyway, Janice. <laughs> yes. So. Write in a book for yourself is what I titled this. You know, I want to start with a statement. God has given us his word. Don't you think it's important? Vital for our walk with him. It is vital in our walk with him because we can get our emotions. We can get our emotions all stirred up. We can see things happening around us. But sometimes our emotions and our feelings don't line up with the word of God. And we always need to build our lives and our foundation on that because the foundation of God's word is what holds us and helps us to stand no matter what comes in the good times and in the rough times. And so I wanted to start with that statement. The key verse that I'm looking at in Jeremiah 30, verse 2, it says here, well, let's start at 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, write in a book for yourself all the words that I have spoken to you. And so, you know, we get that. We get these words that have been written down. But I, I got thinking, this section and instruction of God to Jeremiah to write the words in a book reminded me of God's instructions, his governing principles of the kings that would rise in Israel. And you can find that. I'm not going to read the whole thing in, in its entirety, but Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 14 through 20 talks about the principles governing the kings of Israel. Verse 18 says, also it shall be, and he's, it's talking about the kings, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him. And he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. It goes on to say that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So even the kings, guys, they were instructed to write out, not just have somebody tell them about it, mm -hmm. but to physically take their writing instrument and write it for themselves. You know, I remember being in high school and preparing for exams. And the best way for me to prepare was to make notes. I would study. And as I studied, I would take notes. And somehow in that, that transfer of reading and then taking it in my own mind and writing it through my pen, it helped me to remember. Mm -hmm. So this makes sense to me that, that it literally becomes a part of who you are. And then to be able to read it to read it and know it, and then to teach it to your children, to the next generation. So very important. And so that's a big part of what we do here at Bible Discovery. We believe in the authority of God's word. We believe that it is God's word. And we come to it, and we're not going to get it perfect 100% of the time. I can, I can tell you that because we're imperfect people. But we are a people. We're a family that loves the Lord. Our staff ha is our family. We've worked together for so many years now. And, and our heart's desire is for us to learn in God's word and to share it with you so that you can learn with us. And uh, so whether that is to write out the words too, 
I, I think, think it's a great I idea. Think Deuteronomy 17 says that. It says when you when you're king. This is the kings. Yes. When you get when mm -hmm. you have a king, Israel, you, he needs to. One of the things he read. needs to do, he mm -hmm. needs to write this out. Yeah. And so I read that when I was young, and I did not have good grades when I was young. And I was praying, Lord, I got to get my grades better. Help me get my. And then I read that scripture. I didn't realize it, and I re I thought, oh take notes. And so, I mean, it seems like a relatively easy thing to pontificate on, but I said, oh, I'm going to start taking notes. I started taking notes in class and my grades went up. I went from D's and C's. I went to A's and B's. You know, sometimes we take the path of least resistance, don't we? <laughs> and if we don't have to do the work, if we can just listen and then try to do the best that we can, there is so much more that you will get, that you will receive in your heart and in your life when you make the decision to personally begin to read the Word of God. And it may be difficult for you at first. It may be hard for you to comprehend at first. But I promise you, even little bite-sized pieces, your appetite will begin to develop and you will begin to grow and learn and change and follow the Lord so that when you come in circumstances in life, which you will, you will know how to go to God and call upon Him. And when you hear things going on that don't sound quite right, you can go to the Word and check it out and follow the Lord. I want to tell you about a network we have called Bible Discovery Network. It's very, very interesting and you can find it on Roku channel. You can find it on Fire Stick. You can also find it at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. It's a place where we put all of our programs and they go one after another. Plus this program, and some of you may be watching this program there, is also on there. So just make sure that you understand that is very, very important. Father, I pray today that uh, you would help us to hear what you're saying in your word. Help us to listen to Jeremiah in Jesus' name, amen.